The Holy Spirit gifts. It's a topic that uh, has, uh, has been introduced, mentioned in certain circles, but not everywhere. And it's um, one of those things as questions. I wonder what that's about and why it was uh, important in the Bible. And particularly in the New Testament times is what we're going to be looking at uh, tonight. So these are, this is what we're going to cover this evening. The Bible's Holy Spirit gifts. What are the gifts that the Bible actually mentions? We're going to have a look at what gifts were given by God to uh, the believers at uh, the New Testament period of time. We've seen a little bit of that in Acts chapter 2. Then we're going to see when these gifts actually occurred. We're going to then work out what the purpose of those gifts were. Um, We're going to look at how those gifts were passed between believers. Uh, Important to consider that component of it. Then we're going to consider, did these gifts, gifts from God actually stop or did they continue on through time? Um, and then we want to have a look at the current day, what people will be saying about these Holy Spirit gifts. So, starting uh, this evening, what are the gifts that the Bible mentions? Well, the first one we've really seen there in Acts chapter 2. And what was interesting there was that in Jerusalem, about 50 odd days after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of Pentecost here, um, what happened was people stayed around for this day of Pentecost that may have been travelling to the area or the region. And as we see that there was people in that area from multiple different countries. Uh, Verse uh, 9 says that there was Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Dwellers of the Mesopotamia area, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. And just in case that wasn't enough, we've got some more places. Uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia in Egypt and parts of Libya, Cyrene, Rome, Jews and proselytes. So we're we're talking just a, a good number of people there in Jerusalem. And... What actually happened here in this very first instance that we're looking at is the disciples of Jesus started to speak Jesus' message to the gathering, the people. And it says here that the people in verse 6, they could hear them speak in their very own language. So the very first gift that was given was this ability for the preacher to be able to speak in a language that they were not familiar with, that they had not been trained in in relation to that. And in fact, I've said here it's speaking in foreign, different, unlearned languages. But in this case, it was actually really special because it appears that one person was giving a message and multiple people were hearing it in their own original language at that point of time. So it was the Holy Spirit was actually working on the receivers of that message at that point of time. So we know here that these preachers, the disciples of Jesus, they were out giving the message to the people of the day and those people were hearing it in their own languages. So the very first gift that we are introduced to in the Bible, straight after verses 1 to 4, where they receive the Holy Spirit gifts, um, is that they were able to speak in different languages. And that's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing evidence that uh, these unlearned people from the region of Galilee, as it was presented and, and spoken about, that they were able to talk in other languages. You see, people could understand that they had a dialect from a certain region. It's just like us here. We can understand English. It's spoken by the locals in our area. But if you go to, say, Adelaide, you don't know what they're talking about. Um, Whereas, So what this scenario was is that they could tell that these men were from Galilee 
and they were unlearned. They didn't know really about multiple different languages, but yet they were able to converse. And this was an amazing ability that the Holy Spirit gave them. All of a sudden, they could preach not only to the people that lived in the Galilee region, the area where they came from, but they could preach to the whole world in relation to that. So the gift of God allowed the gospel message to be preached further than what otherwise would have been allowed. Okay, another gift. Working our way through the book of Acts, we find that there's a gift of healing. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, And beholding the man which was healed standing, the people that were going to punish the disciples for causing some sort of an uproar in the city of Jerusalem, they couldn't actually talk against what the disciples of God were saying. You see, in Acts chapter 4, the uh, two of the apostles were, went out and they healed a man who then came and met them in the temple region. And they were saying, hang on a minute, how did this all occur? And people started to believe on the disciples because they could see that this man was healed. They knew that this man had been previously asking every person that walked in through the gate, can you please help me out? Can you please give me some money? Because I'm, I can't go out and work for myself to earn money, to buy food, to, to live my life. So what they did instead, he, he was healed. And the apostle there said, in reply to him said silver and gold have I none but such as I have I'll give to you arise take up your bed and walk in relation to that so he was then taken up from uh, his current position to be able to live a ordinary good life in relation to that now I think that's important that we see that the ability to heal was one of the abilities of the Holy Spirit gifts. It allowed people to instantly see the power that the, uh, the apostles and preachers of the gospel had that was there to support their message that they were then giving. In fact, this man in Acts chapter 4, he was questioning the leaders when the leaders were saying, we don't know how you really got healed in relation to this. We all knew that you were uh, that you were lame and you couldn't work, but we knew. But they were sort of saying, "Well, he was saying, well, I don't know how they managed to heal me, but it is a miraculous event in relation to that." So, one of the gifts is the gift of healing. Another gift was the gift of prophecy. So the, the concept of prophecy is being able to foretell the future events that were going to occur. And if you go back into the Old Testament, it would say that you would understand and know if a prophet was true if some of the prophecies that they said actually occurred in their lifetime, in their time. So some prophets would be prophetically talking about things in a long time in the future. And we can see that if we go through, say, some of parts of Daniel. Daniel uh, interpreted visions. He was given visions of his own that discussed the future. But he also had to interpret things that were happening right then and there. He was also pr prophetically talking about those events in his own lifetime. So a prophet uh, would be foretelling things that occurred in the very near future that otherwise wouldn't rather be known. And we're not just talking about saying, you know what, tomorrow the sun's going to rise in the east and set in the west because that's not really prophecy. We all know that's going to occur. So a prophecy was something, knowledge about something that we otherwise didn't really know. So in Acts chapter 2, which we had read for us, we have the reference to, uh, in verse 16, to the prophet Joel. And in there it says, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and my servants on uh, and on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So, one of the important things that was mentioned in the Old Testament by a prophet was that there was going to be a pouring out of the spirit on believers who were then going to be able to prophesy and foretell the future in, to, in relation to things that were that was shortly going to happen onto in front of them on the earth and also a significant time into the future. Later on in Acts chapter 21 and verse uh, 9, or if you go a couple of verses earlier that, um, the apostle Paul, who at this stage was not part of the apostle group, he was traveling back to Jerusalem and it says that he called in and stayed with one Philip, the evangelist or the preacher. And Philip had four daughters and they did prophesy. So the sons and daughters who had had that Holy Spirit were able to prophesy and were known by those around them that they did prophesy. So it's, it's pretty amazing that it just wasn't uh, for instance, the uh, the apostles, the say the um, at this stage the eleven apostles, or well, they had had an extra one, a twelfth apostle had joined the group by this stage, and then we also have the apostle Paul who joins a bit later as one, as it says, born out of due season, not in that original grouping of apostles, but here we have that. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. And if you go and have a look in Acts 21 and verse 9, as I've got up there on the screen, it says the same man had four daughters and they did prophesy. So that was known about them that they were prophets, which is just one of those little things. So one of the gifts that you would expect to see or hear about when you think about the Holy Spirit gifts is the gift of prophecy. Another gift, and this one is a little bit more interesting because this one is the gift of knowledge. Now, the gift of knowledge is a little bit interesting because you think, is that just someone's a bit smart, a bit wise, a bit knowledgeable? Well, knowledge was very important for the original, the beginning of the uh, believers of the New Testament period of time. Why do I say that? Well, there has been a significant change from the Old Testament period of times to the times after the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament times, you have periods of um, worshipping and serving God in a particular manner. And that was we had a designated priesthood uh, that the people had to go and present to and present sacrifices in relation to their position and their belief and their love of, of God. And should you have done something incorrect, uh, which was deemed to be a sin or breaking a law, you would have a series of sacrifices or ways in which you would uh, rectify or present back to the things of God. But once Jesus comes along, Jesus, as we know, becomes that high priest, becomes a mediator between God and man, becomes a way in which we can ask for forgiveness without having to go through the sacrifices and presenting ourselves to a priest to ask for forgiveness in those things. That's a significant change. In fact, when the... Uh, apostles went out and preached and taught throughout the world the apostles would often go to the Jewish synagogues first and talk to them and say to them look I'm going to tell you about the real hope of the Bible the real hope of the of the of your forefathers Abraham Isaac Jacob David uh, Isaiah the prophet Daniel I'm going to talk to you about all these faithful men of old but what were they really looking forward to? They were living in that Old Testament time, but they were looking forward to the time of Christ. And we know that because of how 
you know, even uh, right at the beginning of the Lord Jesus Christ's uh, life, he was presented at the temple and there was two faithful old uh, believers at that point of time that were looking forward to that day when they would be able to behold the Lord's anointed. And uh, so people knew that there was a change coming. And so the, the apostles and disciples went out to the world and they preached first in the synagogues. And if their message was not uh, understood or believed, they moved on and spoke to the Gentiles. And sometimes that was in the marketplaces, sometimes it was in in areas where they were worshipping, um, and other times it was right next door to the synagogue in a house that might be owned by someone who was running the synagogue. But uh, things like that were what they did in, in relation to those things. But the knowledge in particular was to allow the transition from Old Testament periods of time to post the Lord Jesus Christ period of time. And we're going to have to explore that a little bit more in in detail uh, uh, shortly. And um, let's just have a look at Romans chapter 15 in relation to that. Now, the book of the Romans um, is, a, is a very good book that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote uh, during his time of ministry. And he explains a lot of topics, particularly about the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ and how that is um, somewhat, you know, it's a logical scenario of of God being God's word being fulfilled from the Old Testament period of time. But in Romans chapter 15, right near the end of the book, verse 14, um, we might read from verse... Um, 12 it says Isaiah said there shall be a root of Jesse which is the Lord Jesus Christ the descendant of Jesse and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles trust now the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit and I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. And the word there, admonish, is to give advice, to warn, uh, to give instruction to each other. Now, the only way you can do this through the power of from verse 13 through the power of the holy spirit is if you've got the knowledge to be able to do that and that's exactly what it tells us there that they were full of goodness and they were filled with knowledge and because they were filled with knowledge they could then pass that message on advise each other in relation to those things so the the, the real reference here is just actually saying well the knowledge was through the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we could go and touch on, um, and we might touch a bit later in uh, 1 Timothy in relation to that, that he was referenced, that he was had the gift of knowledge in relation to that, uh, to, to his gift that he had been given by the laying of the hands uh, from those um, about at that point of time. So we've covered off essentially what, what I think are the main gifts of the Holy Spirit that we sort of know of. That is um, the gift of languages, the gift of healing, gift of prophecy and a gift of knowledge. So when did these gifts occur? Well... If we uh, had a look back at our reading, which we had read for us uh, this evening, Acts chapter 2, the beginning of that chapter tells us that the apostles, when they were gathered together in Jerusalem in one place, that the Holy Spirit, it said, came upon them or descended on them in a visual form, as it were, uh, tongues of fire or uh, the flame of fire that came and rested on their on their heads on each one of them at that point of time, 
And it said there in uh, verse 3, And they were filled, or verse 4, They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they began to speak in other languages in relation to that. Now, we did already see uh, from, from uh, when we were looking earlier on that this was prophesied that this would occur in the future by the prophet Joel. And it said that, and if you actually go back and have a look, not just in the uh, reference in <coughs> Acts chapter 2, but you go back to Joel chapter 2, mm-hmm. verse 28, you can read that exactly what he said, where it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit, which is he's talking about the Holy Spirit, but upon those people on all flesh, it will be upon humanity. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. So the Holy Spirit, when it was given, wasn't just limited to a certain category of people in relation to that. It wasn't just the leaders of each gathering, wherever, which city they might have been in. It's saying here that it's going to be upon your sons and your daughters, uh, on some old men, and it's going to be on the young men, as it were. This power was not limited to just one group of people in relation to this. It was specifically given, as we'll see that in a minute. So, what was the purpose of the gifts? Well, in Acts chapter 2, which we didn't read later on, we find a little bit more of this information. So in Acts chapter 2, and I've got there verses 38 through to 40, um, we'll just pick it up while we're reading for background in uh, verse 37, that after Peter and the uh, disciples of Jesus, the apostles, those people sent out with with the message, after that point, after they had uh, been speaking to the people in Jerusalem, it says here that they were pricked in their hearts. They, they had a conscience. They, there was something about this message that they wanted to know more about. They were trying to understand what this was about. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And this is where we've got up here in, in verse 38. Peter says to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children that are afar off, even as many as our Lord, our God, shall call. And with many other words, the disciples testified and exhorted, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation so let's just unpack that a little bit so the people who had been listening to the message came from all these different countries speaking their own different languages yes they could understand probably some of the Hebrew that would have been speaking because otherwise why would they be going to Jerusalem to worship at this point of time they probably did have some language but it says here that they could hear it in their own language from verse uh, 8 in that chapter and when they had received this message they had a conscience so they decided that they should be asking and seeking and doing more so the power of the Holy Spirit really was to be able to help pass the gospel message on to those around them. So they had to do something in relation to this. They had to repent. They had to change their ways. They had to make a decision that their current way of life needed to change. It was a decision they had to make. Repent. And the way they did that and the way that made sense to them being able to do that was they could see that this message that was being presented to them was powerful, was logical, was being able to be understood. 
And then it said that if they did this, they could receive the Holy Spirit. It says, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he refers back to the prophet Joel in verse 39, where he says, this promise of the Holy Spirit is to you and to your children and to those that are far off. So let's just unpack that. So what are we talking about to you and to your children? Well, really quite simple. We are preaching to you. And if you bring your children through that line of belief of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they too accept the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as the salvation and the forgiveness of sins that God has offered through Jesus, well, guess what? They too could receive the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and to those are far off. Well, what we find is that the rest of the book of Acts actually starts talking about the way in which they preached, not only in Jerusalem, but they went out to Judea, they went out to Samaria, which is next door to the land of Israel, and then they were spread through the then known uh, European slash uh, Roman world, as it were. And uh, they were able to travel and to be able to preach and be able to and pass God's message on in relation to, to that. So the purpose of the gifts, really quite simple, was to be able to allow the gospel message to be preached, to be to be spoken about, and to be passed on in relation to those things. The next thing we had to look at was how these gifts were transferred. So when we were looking um, here in Acts chapter two, verse thirty-nine, the apostles were and the disciples were saying to the people that they were preaching to. Hey, repent, be baptized, and this will happen. We'll be able to, um, you also will be able to be blessed with this gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's consider um, some some of these other um, how that gift was actually transferred and, and passed on. In Acts chapter eight, we have an interesting period of time where the apostles. Uh, are essentially starting to spread the word of God out into uh, the communities that were um, around Jerusalem and and getting further and further out into the area, into uh, Samaria um, in the early part of Acts chapter 8. And then uh, later on in... um, Acts chapter 8 we have um, that um, we'll we'll get to that in a minute but in verse um, 14 it says that the apostles which were at Jerusalem had heard that the word of God had gone out into the area of Samaria now Samaria as I said it's very close to the Judea uh, Israeli area Um, but there was a little bit of um, conflict, as it were, between the various peoples of the people that lived in the Sumerian or Samaritan area and the Jewish people. You can think back just quite simply into uh, two events of, the, of Jesus when he talks about a uh, parable of a man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and falls amongst thieves and gets beaten up. And who was going to look after him? Was it going to be a a priest, a Levite, or a Samaritan in relation to this? And that was a a question in which was, uh, uh, you know, who was going to be the the good neighbour in relation to that? And another time when uh, Jesus was sort of uh, leaving the area of uh, Jerusalem, he travels through the Samaria, a Samaritan area, and there's a discussion in relation to uh, a lady there, and also the elders of one of the towns uh, of the Samaritan area, and there were, you can read that there is this uneasy animosity, as it were, between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. But so, in verse uh, fourteen, uh, I digress. 
they uh, the the leaders, the apostles at this point of time had heard that the word of God had gone out into the area of Samaria and they rejoiced. And when they went down, so they went to, into the area of the Samaritans, they came down and prayed with them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because at that stage, um, for as yet, uh, the Holy Spirit was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were actually baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit had not yet been given to them. And in verse 17 it said, Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So the apostles that were sent down from Jerusalem laid their hands upon these believers, these baptized believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when they were there, one of the people, this guy called Simon, was there in verse 18. We read about him in verse 9. But in verse 18, he sees this power that the apostles, the leaders that came down from Jerusalem, laid their hands on these believers and power was transferred to them. So the transferring of this power occurred by this laying on of hands and laid their hands and they received the Holy Spirit in verse 17 and he requested at that point of time that he would have this special ability that he could pass on that's that power of the Holy Spirit to, to those about him and he said look you know I've, I've got money I could buy that option like if that how we organize to be one of these people that allows it to occur i will buy my way into this and look it's a natural thing of the humankind to be able to if you've got means to be able to do something is to be able to buy your way into things really quite simple let's just say you wanted to go to a uh, an event and you'll have a look online and there'll be different levels of seating and if you want to sit in the best seat what they call the box seat Guess what? You pay more money for that that uh, option in relation to this. So if you've got money, you can sometimes get things that other people can't. And Simon had money and he said, I will give you money if you can give me this power that I can transfer this gift on. But the apostle said to him and said, um, Peter says to him, we don't want your money. Let your money perish with you. It's not about money at all. It's about loving the things of God. It's about knowing what God is all about. And the purpose of having this gift, this Holy Spirit gifts, is not just about going around and speaking in different languages. It's not about knowing lots of things. It's not about healing just anyone and everyone. It's about a gift of God that is particularly useful to you in your area and the things that he's doing in your life and so he was the the apostle was not interested in um, in the things that uh, Simon was requesting because he, he definitely wanted that now just to reiterate how that carried on throughout time I've got a reference here to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, this the history of the man Timothy is that he lived up in the region of the, the Turkish region. And when the Apostle Paul was travelling through that area, he met uh, Timothy. In fact, Timothy was referred to him by some other believers and said hey this young man coming through Timothy seems to be um, you know quite bright quite quite a lovely guy in which you really should go and have a chat to uh, Timothy and, and spend some time with him and Timothy ended up going with the Apostle Paul on some of his journeys and going and supporting new uh, groups of believers while the Apostle went on and preached elsewhere but later on in Timothy's life the Apostle Paul writes a letter to him, really to stir up um, his 
uh, zeal to keep going and keep um, being the best disciple that he could possibly be. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says this little reference to, uh, to Timothy getting this Holy Spirit. And, um, and, you know, we'll just read from um, um, verse 13. It says, Till I come, so till we come back together and, and being able to meet together and have a discussion, I want you to give attendance or take note of and, and do the following things. To reading, to exhortation, to doctrines, and don't neglect or neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying of the hands of the presbytery or the, the rulers, the apostles. Meditate upon these things, give yourself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. So, someone further on in time, being Timothy, many years after the event of Acts chapter 8, he also received a gift of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands from uh, the leaders at that point of time. So, as I said, this, this power to be able was transferred via this laying on of their hands. Interesting. So, did the gifts cease? Did they stop? Well, the first thing we'd probably say is, well, they logically, if the people that were not being able to lay their hands on people ceased to exist, died because of mortality, they were, you're probably going to say that the gifts did cease. But, in fact, it's actually discussed in 1 Corinthians. In the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, the apostle Paul is, is writing to uh, the people that lived in Corinth and he writes a number of uh, letters to the people of Corinth um, and, it's, and it's again um, the believers of the area of Corinth in a brand new group of believers were exploring and trying to learn and trying to understand the things of God and they were coming up against lots of different things that they hadn't thought of and so the apostle paul is writing to them saying well this is the way in which you should run your group of people together and we read that in, in earlier chapters but in chapter 13 um, we have this chapter that sort of talks about charity or love in relation to these things and often you'll hear this this chapter uh, read it different things such as weddings and, and, and like the such like. But one of the references here in verses 8 through to 10, we read this. Charity or love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail or stop. Whether there be tongues, you know, the gift of languages as it were, they shall stop. Whether there be knowledge, it shall be stopped or vanished away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is part shall be done away. So what we're talking here, this perfect componentry of things, is we're talking about a, a perfect knowledge, a mature knowledge of things. So... How was that going to occur? Well, as I said earlier, remember we've just transitioned from a period of the Old Testament where it was a time under the law of Moses. And we had, if we uh, broke a law of the Moses, there were certain sacrifices that we had to do and, and, and requests for forgiveness. And even at that point of time, even if we thought we were all forgiven, Annually, the high priest would also ask for forgiveness over and above that. So there was a constant request for forgiveness in relation to this. And the way of, the, that way of forgiveness was changed with our Lord Jesus Christ. So the change in the transition 
is based around knowledge. So once knowledge has increased, perfect is come, then that which is in part is going to be done away with. So the part that was the Holy Spirit gifts were sort of covering, filling the gap until the full maturity of knowledge was able to be had. So how do we get that? Well, as each part of the Bible was then written, it was full, well, more full, fuller knowledge that was then transitioned and passed on in relation to these. So the items that the Apostle speaks to the Corinthians about, and he writes in other letters as well to other places, that knowledge gets passed on to all the other believers in relation to that. So um, what does that actually mean um, for, for us? Well, what about today? Does that mean that these Holy Spirit gifts have actually ceased? Well, according to 1 Corinthians, if we've now got mature knowledge, and I would say that we've got mature knowledge because the gospel record, the canon of scripture, or the, the, the Bible as we have it, has now been completed. Nothing's been added to the Bible since the book of Revelation was written in about AD 96. So at the conclusion of that period of time, the full knowledge is then able to have said that we have maturity by able to read the word of God. The first thing I'd like to say, though, is in 1 John chapter 4, we're encouraged to just not believe what someone says to us. It says their beloved, you know, talking to the believers uh, of the, of the uh, area of Judea, or um, land of uh, where the Jewish people were at the time, believe not every spirit but try the spirits to see whether they are of God so and we're talking here spirit is so like the words that someone's talking to you we want you to go back and see whether they actually stack up with the word other words of God that we now know he says because there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world so what I'm going to say today is if someone says <coughs> Believe the things that I'm telling you because I'm a really good person or I have really good knowledge of these things. First thing would say is try, think about it. Does that make logical sense? Now, you know, some things in your life, when you're, let's just say there's um, something wrong with your car, you go to a mechanic and you hope that the mechanic has experienced that thing before. And if the mechanic has, you can say, well, okay, I'll listen to you because it's pretty right. But if they've never had that issue that your car presents, well, guess what? Eh, maybe they don't know what they're talking about. Maybe you need to go to another mechanic and have a look and find out what they're talking about. And so what I'm saying here is, just like that, as it were, mechanic... You need to consider the message. Does it stack up with the word of God? So if someone says something to you about salvation, you need to check and make sure that it stacks up with the things of God. Because there could be false prophets out there. And so what I'm saying to you even about Christadelphians is make sure the message you get, you go back and check your Bible. Go back and make sure that these things actually stack up. At the end of the Gospel record of Mark, the after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, we read the following uh, few verses. And normally we look at the end of Mark, uh, um, and we look at it often at the end of uh, Bible preaching uh, times. But in verse 17 to 18, we read this. 
It says, Now these signs shall follow after them. In my name they shall cast out devils, or they shall be able to heal people, because we, we would need to go back and re- look, re- reflect on in relation to that. They're going to be able to heal people. They're going to be able to speak in new languages, new tongues. They shall be able to take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Okay, so just that comment there says they shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. If Holy Spirit gifts were available today... You might say to yourself, well, translation services would be really good if I could, don't need to have Google Translate on my phone or anything else. I could just have someone with the Holy Spirit gift who could translate for me. Absolutely. That would be a fantastic option. The second option there is, what about the hospitals and the sick people that are around us today? And people will say, well... The gift of healing that's available through the Holy Spirit gifts of their church that they may be involved with, you need to have faith to believe that. And I would challenge that because the Apostle Paul, on his way back to Jerusalem, uh, back when he on that trip back where he met with uh, Philip the Evangelist and his daughters that did prophesy, on one of the cities that he stops, he starts to gather the believers together and he talks with them and he had a really good message and he kept talking to them and it got to midnight and someone was sitting trying to prop themselves up in the window of the building and they fell asleep. They fell out and they died. The Apostle Paul and all the believers went down there. The guy's dead. How could he believe, have faith to be healed? But the Apostle Paul raised him to life. And it said that he came back in and he was there until the breaking of day. So he was there for another six hours, not on medication trying to stay well. He was able to do that and live and and be able to do that. So you don't need the faith of the person who's being healed is not actually required. Otherwise, our dead person's got faith. And that's not the case in relation to that. So it comes down to what was the real purpose of the Holy Spirit gifts. As I said, there was a transition from under the law of Moses to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing you've got to be able to understand. The second component of it was be able to preach the gospel, able to spread the good news that Jesus was uh, through the life, the, the death, the burial and the resurrection, that there was salvation to mankind. It was also there through the knowledge to be able to assist a newly formed groups of believers that didn't have the the full knowledge of of the apostles who had been with Jesus in relation to that. So as the gospel went out through the world and we saw Corinth and uh, the Colossian area and and other areas of, um, we'll look at Colossians next, um, next slide. But as the message went out, they formed these new groups of believers and they had issues they didn't understand what they should do and so this knowledge was very important to them at that point of time so the real purpose was developing the faith of believers and to be able to spread the gospel news message so what took the place of the holy spirit gifts as we sort of read there at the end of um first corinthians chapter 13 verses 8 through to 10 well what you actually got to understand is that these gospel records Matthew Mark Luke and John the things about the life of Jesus and then the letters that went out through uh, the world or like to the various groups of believers were essentially passed on to each of the believing areas so that the message didn't have to be Rewritten. In fact, the the message, the core of the message is what's been left for us, is in is here in our Bible. We actually know that there was other letters that were written that were very important to the believers of that period of time, and we see that in Colossians chapter 
4 and verse 16. It's the last chapter of the book of uh, Colossians. So it's the last bit of this letter that was written to this um, uh, group of believers in the region of Turkey. Um, And it says, when you read this letter or this epistle that I'm writing to you, make sure you read it also in the church or with a group of believers in the Laodicean area. And likewise, read the one, the letter that I'm sending or the epistle I'm sending to the Laodiceans back for yourselves to have a read and understand. So these are two groups of believers in two different cities. And the apostle's actually writing two different letters. And he says, I've written this one to you and we've got a copy of that one. The other one's also important. You actually should be reading that one and make sure they both read each other's letters. So the believers as before the book of Revelation was finally written and the, and the Bible was then put together, what they had to do was read these things and learn what was being passed between the ecclesias in relation to that. And therefore the access to preaching uh, was going to be able to be a lot better because you could therefore reference and refer back to those things not only in the Old Testament as what was previously available but now also into what was now known as the New Testament of the Bible so we come to the the final part and this question is why why is this important well in the Old Testament and I refer this to everyone that in Proverbs 25 and verse 2, that it is the glory of God to conceal something, but it is the honour of kings to search out a matter. And therefore, what I'm saying to you is, you need to consider the Bible. You need to look at it for yourself. You don't need someone to say that they have the Holy Spirit to be able to believe them in what they're saying and what they're doing. You need to see that it's what it's actually saying in the Bible. Open the word, search out the scripture, search out the facts of a matter, because God's written it all there for us. He's concealed it. He's put it in in a way in which a lot of people can't be bothered to look at so they will just go along to a church or a group because someone else has done the research and the study no it's not like that search out the matter and it will be of great honor and and of a great uh, blessing to you i was going to uh, just while i've been giving this address i was thinking I really need to refer to Hebrews. Um, So, I was thinking Hebrews 2 verse 4 was in my mind where it says, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. What's all that about? Well, you're going to have to find out and you're going to have to research it and look at it and find out as i just said it's going to be the glory of god to conceal it and the honor of kings to find out the matter what hebrews is talking about in relation to that but it's exactly what we think of when we know that god blessed the believers in the early stage and gave them signs and wonders to be able to prove that the things of god was uh, through the way in which they ran, um, the apostles ran the early parts of the the believers and the groups of uh, believers, which um, we called them ecclesias because that's what they were called in the early days, um, and uh, that's what was done. So, hopefully, that's been able to uh, help you consider uh, tonight's topic that the Holy Spirit's gifts were available. They were there for a period of time. They were taken away because we now have the full scripture available for us to understand and to refer to and read. Thank you.